Welcome to Washington Today for October 3rd, 2022. I'm Gary Sterkoff. Thanks a lot for listening this afternoon. Here are some of today's headlines. The remnants of Hurricane Ian continue to soak the mid-Atlantic. In Virginia, the cities of Norfolk and Virginia Beach have declared states of emergency as they get ready for what could be the worst tidal flooding event there in more than a decade. Here in the D.C. area, we've already seen upwards of three inches of rain with more to come in the next 36 hours. On the Jersey Shore, areas around Atlantic City are under coastal flood warnings. In Florida, the storm's death toll has risen to more than 100, with nearly 600,000 homes and businesses still without power, and more than 100 boil water advisories in effect by the Florida Health Department. And the federal disaster response continues to ramp up, with President Biden announcing Wednesday, or he will travel to Florida on Wednesday. Today, the president was in Puerto Rico to survey the damage from another big tropical storm, Hurricane Fiona. We'll have more on that, plus a personal account of a Fort Myers residence on surviving Hurricane Ian's landfall and rescuing his elderly neighbor from rising waters. The Supreme Court started its new term today, the first day on the court for new Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, and among the court's first decisions allowing Dominion Voting Systems defamation lawsuit against MyPillow CEO Mike Lindell to move forward. Dominion is seeking $1.3 billion in damages against claims by Mike Lindell and others that it rigged its machines to help Joe Biden win the 2020 presidential election. We'll have more on what to expect from the new Supreme Court term coming up. Iran's supreme leader is blaming the U.S. and Israel for the recent wave of protests that has rocked the country following the death of a young woman who was taken into custody by the nation's morality police. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, quote, broke our hearts, but that the reaction of protesters was, quote, designed by America, the fake Zionist regime, those who are on their payroll and some traitorous Iranians abroad who helped them. He also defended the Iranian police cracking down on the protests. We begin in Puerto Rico, where President Biden announced $60 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law for disaster recovery and preparedness. The ongoing Hurricane Ian recovery efforts have threatened to overshadow the devastation in Puerto Rico, which was ravaged by Hurricane Fiona more than two weeks ago. More than 100,000 people there continue to go without power. The official death toll remains at 25, but that is expected to go up. With more, here's the president speaking from Ponce, a city on the island's southern coast. So many people have been displaced from their homes, lost their jobs and savings, or suffered injuries, often unseen, but more many times seen. Yet somehow, the people of Puerto Rico keep getting back up with resilience and determination. Quite frankly, it's pretty extraordinary when you look at it from afar. And you deserve every bit of help your country can give you. That's what I'm determined to do, and that's what I promise you. After Maria, Congress approved billions of dollars for Puerto Rico, much of it not having gotten here initially. We're going to make sure you get every single dollar promised. And I'm determined to help Puerto Rico build faster than in the past and stronger and better prepared for the future. And that's why. I approved emergency declaration in Puerto Rico before the hurricane. Governor, remember my call on you before the hurricane made landfall to deliver immediate federal funding to shelter people and provide essential support. Just a few days later, I approved an expedited major disaster declaration. That means the federal government will cover 100 percent of the cost to clear debris and carry out search and rescue and continue to shelter people. It also means homeowners, renters, business owners, are eligible to apply for federal help to recover damaged losses caused by Hurricane Fiona. The federal government is going to provide individual assistance for up to $37,900 for essential home repairs and another $37,900 for lost property, as the law calls for, like a car or a refrigerator. Additionally, we've deployed more than 1,200 personnel from FEMA, the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, they include search and rescue, teams to assist survivors, and power restoration experts. Power is now back, as you pointed out, governed at 92 percent at 92 percent of the island, and water is back at 95 percent of the island, thanks in part to the dedicated IBW workers and federal support staff. <clears throat> now we have to get to 100 percent. President Biden speaking earlier today in Ponce, Puerto Rico. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell joined the president on the trip. She spoke to reporters aboard Air Force One. 
Um, I was also on the ground a few weeks before that checking on the recovery efforts from Hurricane Maria. Uh, we have one very integrated team between the Commonwealth, um, our FEMA family, as well as our federal partners working together to make sure that we are doing everything we can to continue the recovery process from Maria while we are still responding to and stabilizing the impacts that we're seeing from Hurricane Fiona. Uh, we have over 900 personnel on the ground uh, dedicated right now specifically to the ongoing efforts for Fiona in addition to our staff that are continuing to support the recovery efforts from Maria. Uh, the report that I got this morning, because I believe it was 92 or 93 percent of the um, power has been restored on the island, 95 percent of the water has been restored on the island, um, but we are working with them to drive to 100 percent. We know that's where we need to be, um, and we're working to get that done as quickly as possible. FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell speaking aboard Air Force One. Meanwhile, Florida Senator Rick Scott is calling for more funding to help recovery efforts in his state. Here he is yesterday on CBS News' Face the Nation. The disaster modeling firms have, you know, scale of damage here from 30 billion up to 100 billion. How much money is it that you think you need to go ask Congress for? We're going to find out, hopefully, uh, most uh, most things are covered by insurance. That's what that's what you hope. Now, Florida has has had a problem the last few years with their property insurance market. Uh, so hopefully, uh, the insurance companies will be able to uh, to cover a lot of that. Um, but not but flooding. We'll, we'll see. The way the way this has worked in while well, I was governor. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And so that's one of the issues. Florida has been a uh, significant donor state to flooding. Unfortunately, there's many people that don't have flood insurance either because they didn't know they need to buy flood insurance or because it got too expensive. So we've got to have insurance products uh, that work that people can afford. And that's one thing I tried to continue to build the private flood insurance market when I was governor uh, to, and try to make sure people can get flood insurance and can afford flood insurance because you're right. A lot of it's not covered. If it's not, it's not covered by a normal policy. It's covered by a flood insurance policy. And right. I was up in uh, in Kissimmee yesterday, and there was some flight up there, and no, they, they weren't in a flood plane. Nobody was told to get flood insurance, and they had about uh, probably a foot of water in in their homes, and they were just completely shocked. Florida Republican Senator Rick Scott speaking on Face the Nation on CBS News yesterday. If you watched or read any of the coverage of Hurricane Ian's landfall last Thursday, you might have seen a picture of a lone woman sitting on the front steps of her home at the Riverwalk apartment complex in Fort Myers. On the street behind her, far from its original mooring, sat a large boat wedged between two apartment buildings. That woman's name is Brenda. She is a first floor resident of the Riverwalk complex, and she had been rescued the night before by her neighbor, Gage Long. Fort Myers-based journalists Holly Coyle and Paul Raphael talked to Gage Long about his experience surviving Ian's landfall and rescuing his neighbor, Brenda. When it got about, when the, the boat got about right here, that's when I seen a message. I had this girl over here named Stephanie. She lives on a lower one. But she was actually in the front or over here in this one. And she messaged me and asked me what apartment number number seven was and I told her that it was the one underneath me that's when she sent me a screenshot of Miss Brenda downstairs I guess there was something about a post that said tried to reach 911 they couldn't get me or it's like try to call 911 something but they weren't they wasn't able to get her and she was standing on her countertop so she stayed and then they so I'm sitting here and we I come outside and there's all, this is when all the debris and everything's just floating around. So I really couldn't get into it. That's when there was the light, and I told her to wait for. And on this side, the water and the the boat was right here. And there was a bunch of debris right here too. It washed out or something, or moved over to here. Um, and I'm just thinking about live wire right here. There's like this was super calm. So I'm thinking it's not a live wire right now maybe something washed in and there, there could possibly be a bull shark right or something that alligator <laughs> something it's calm water right there was nothing in it it was just water so i'm thinking something to get away from everything went in that so we waited for a minute and i said let's wait till the water tries to see if it gets any higher i'll definitely go in there and get you don't worry about that if it's let's it's stabilized right now it was stabilized for like 30 minutes and she was said that she was still on her counter I said, let it go down. I know we got a bunch of drain systems right here. 
So once that started going down, that's when I climbed right here. We tr I tried to get her to get out of this window that's closest to the, my back door, but she could, she couldn't open that one. So we had a, I had to go around here, open that window up, pull her out, and then we walked her in and gave her some clothes and stuff. Or she had like pants and stuff. Got a little bit of her stuff that was her electronics, her phone and stuff. Then got her warm, she passed out. And then after that, it was just, it wasn't the wind didn't really hit us too much. Like it was hitting us hard, but not enough. I think a lot of that stuff, a lot of this right here blew, like was holding it back. It was more of the surge than anything. But now we just gotta deal with that aftermath and getting everybody First question. Yeah, for uh, together. Yeah, so Gage, oh. like okay. when you pulled her out, can you tell me more about that? She was really shaken up. Like I had to get, I climbed over here and then that's when I was in the water again and pulled her. When I pulled her out, she, I don't know, Miss Brenda's, she's a little fragile right then. She, you could tell, cause she said when I asked her, she said, she said she had been here for a while. Said she had never seen surge like that. So that's the reason she stayed. She's like she'd be fine. She didn't think it was if it was a any water. She thought it would be a foot. But then she said that she actually fell asleep, and then, then that's when water was around her bed, and then that's when she started freaking out. But it wasn't much. We basically, luckily, right here, it was super. It was just a bunch of water, and it was going crazy. But I. I wouldn't want anybody to like leave my grandma like knowing like they're like 10 feet something so that's I was like whatever we just got to do as long as this side was good the, the um, and that debris was over there it was fine yeah so did you like physically like yeah we had we had to I had to pick her up she she luckily she walked through the water right here it wasn't long we just had to get her now if <clears throat> if she would, I I was trying to. I was like, get on my shoulders or get on my back, or we can. I'll get you through. And she's like, I can walk. You got me out the window. That was enough. Just, and then we got all of her stuff or whatever. She had like a bag, but right here, with the like, I don't know. There was a bunch of stuff floating around. We had to like move that during the storm, and it was just the wind was still going crazy. I had to like hold her while holding her up, like the the water was raising and like pushing us and stuff through towards the building and stuff but it wasn't long like it's not like i had to go across the parking lot through all that debris i had to i was able to walk on it but i'm just glad i had this right side because that would have been worse all that debris there's nails and stuff sticking through it could have poked her and you know what i mean like this dirty the water was dirty and stuff like that just it was nasty Fort Myers, Florida resident Gage Long on his experience surviving Hurricane Ian's landfall and rescuing his neighbor Brenda from rising waters. The picture, which was taken by the Associated Press, was featured prominently in the New York Times, ABC News, the Daily Mail, and others. It had millions of views on Instagram and TikTok. And we thank Fort Myers-based journalists Holly Coyle and Paul Raphael for that exclusive sound. You're listening to Washington Today. Live Tuesday on C-SPAN Radio at 10 a.m. Eastern, the Supreme Court hears oral argument in the case Merrill v. Milligan about whether Alabama's 2021 redistricting map for seven congressional seats violates the Federal Voting Rights Act. That's live Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern, Supreme Court case on C-SPAN Radio. Listen anywhere on your smart device. Say play C-SPAN Radio. Welcome back to Washington Today. Here are some more of today's headlines. United Nations officials have warned that the more than 5 million survivors of the devastating flooding in Pakistan are facing serious food crisis in the next three months. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said 16 percent of Pakistan's population was already living in moderate or severe food insecurity before the floods and that they have already delivered aid to 1.6 million people, but there is still not enough food for the survivors. They added that living conditions there pose a major public health risk. Planned Parenthood officials have announced plans for a mobile abortion clinic. The 37-foot-long RV will be based in Illinois. 
but it'll travel close to the borders of nearby states that have banned abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade earlier this year. Dr. Colleen McNicholas, who is chief medical officer for Planned Parenthood's St. Louis office, told National Public Radio that the clinic's goal is to reduce travel times and distances for prospective patients. It will include two exam rooms, a lab, and a waiting room. Initially, it will provide medical abortions up to 11 weeks of pregnancy with plans to provide surgical abortions after its first few months in service. New British Prime Minister Liz Truss has reversed course on her plan to cut taxes for the country's top earners after it triggered turmoil in financial markets and a huge domestic outcry. The proposal included removing an income tax for people making £150,000 a year or more. It was part of an unfunded set of economic reforms that caused the pound to fall to historic lows. The reversal comes just hours after Prime Minister Truss, who's only been in office a short while, defended the tax cut, saying it was necessary to solve the country's long-term economic woes. King Charles III and Queen Consort Camilla visited Scotland on Monday on their first joint public appearance since the royal mourning period for Queen Elizabeth ended. ended. Hundreds turned out in the streets of Dunfermline, Scotland hoping to get a glimpse of the new king, who wore a kilt for the visit and spent time shaking hands with well-wishers after he greeted Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and other leaders. The royal couple were visiting to give the town, which is just north of Edinburgh, a formal city status. And it also happens to be the birthplace of another King Charles, King Charles I, who reigned in the 17th century. Back here in Washington, the Supreme Court is officially began its new session. We will hear argument first this morning in case 21-454, Sackett versus EPA. Mr. Schiff, you're up first this year. Among the cases the court will hear, whether universities can use race as one factor in making admission decisions, if a wedding website designer can tell same-sex couples she will not work for them, and a case that could radically change the way states set rules for federal elections. With more, here's Kimberly Robinson of Bloomberg Law. The first case is an environmental case. It's been a long-running dispute about the EPA's authority to regulate wetlands and water quality. Uh, And then the second case up is a case brought by a handful of states against Delaware uh, about collection of money um, left over from MoneyGram orders. So that's the first day, and then we'll have arguments tomorrow as well to wrap up the week. What are the other high-profile ones this week? Well, this week, there's going to be a very important case on voting rights. Uh, That's going to be the first one up tomorrow. In that case, uh, after the Supreme Court uh, effectively nullified part of the Voting Rights Act, the plaintiffs here are relying on another part of the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, which now has taken on renewed interest. And in that case, they say that Alabama discriminated against its black citizens whenever it refused to create a second majority black district in the state. So that's going to be up on Monday. That's a a really high profile case, uh, one of two voting rights cases that the justices have already agreed to take this term. But we will be adding more than half of the cases in the coming months. And and not the only high profile case involving issues of race. Uh, There's uh, cases this term on race based college admissions that are getting a lot of attention. Explain. That's right. So there are two cases challenging affirmative action. Um, It's one of many, many cases that really do put race at the forefront of this uh, Supreme Court term. Not only this affirmative action case and the voting rights case, but there's also another case trying to strike down the 1970s era Indian Child Welfare Act. So we're going to be talking a lot about race this term, including in those two affirmative action cases, one out of Harvard and one out of North Carolina that the justices will hear in November. And then uh, you talked about the the mother of all orders this morning. What cases could be added to the document? What are you watching for? Well, there are about a thousand cases, so it's really hard to pick out which one the justices are going to say, okay, we need to get involved here. Uh, But there are some interesting cases on DOJ filter teams, which have taken on renewed interests after uh, the Mar-a-Lago search. And there's a couple on that are very important to IP lawyers who have been getting the trying to urge the Supreme Court to take up a really important foundational uh, patent case. Uh, But it's really hard to tell what is going to attract their attention. There's just so many cases um, and so many opportunities for them to look over cases that we really just have to wait and see what happens on today's orders list. How many cases does the Supreme Court hear in a term and and how many cases do they have to go through, sort through, uh, to get that final number that they hear uh, over the course of one term at the Supreme Court? 
Well, they get about 7,000 cases coming to them each term where they're, asked, they're being asked to you know, intervene in cases. But in recent terms, they've taken fewer than 60. So that's less than 1% of the cases actually get the attention of the justices where they think that they need to weigh in. So we've got about 27 cases on the docket so far, more than half of it's you know, uh, docket to fill out. Uh, again, some of those are going to be coming today, but the rest will uh, kind of trail in until January. And we mentioned uh, the pomp and circumstance of the Supreme Court last week, a, a bit of that uh, when uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson uh, officially uh, joined the Supreme Court. It's called the investiture. Explain uh, what happened there. Here's your story on that from Bloomberg Law. Biden joins Jackson uh, at the Supreme Court as this divisive term looms. That's right. So the investiture ceremony on Friday was merely a formality. Justice Jackson has taken her seat uh, in, er, in the summertime, and she's been on the job um, weighing in on orders and things like that. Uh, but Friday, she was formally um, inducted into the court. There are a number of dignitaries, as you mentioned, Biden, also uh, Vice President Harris were here, a number of senators and congressmen. And so uh, that happened on Friday. She'll take the bench for the very first time today to hear arguments, though. And we're really interested to see how she fits in with this new group of nine on the court, which has really seen a lot of turnover in the last five years, and see if maybe there will be some calm on the bench and they'll get a chance to settle in as a group of nine. This group of nine, this Supreme Court, the, the question we're asking our viewers this morning, uh, we're asking about their level of confidence in the Supreme Court right now. Uh, I wonder, as a reporter who follows the Supreme Court, uh, what you're seeing on that front uh, when it comes to public confidence in the Supreme Court this term and, and in recent years. Well, I can't really think of another summer where the Supreme Court was so much in the headlines as it was this summer uh, after the fallout from the Dobbs decision, which overturned 50 years of precedent in Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And what we've been seeing is that the numbers are now at historic lows. Ever since, people have been counting uh, public confidence in the court. It's really at a record low, not just from Democrats, but also from independents who think that the Supreme Court is reaching out and deciding too much and perhaps going too fast to the right. Uh, so that's been happening all summer long, and with the cases that they have on the docket this term, I wouldn't expect that to slow down any. You mentioned the, the Dobbs decision. What's the status of that leak investigation of the Dobbs ruling? Well, we haven't heard that much. We've gotten a few hints from some of the justices in talks that they gave over the summer, which suggests that there has been an internal investigation, that it's completed, and that at least the justices should sometime soon be getting a look at a report. Uh, but it's still unclear whether or not they're going to release that report to the public or even tell us when they've given it to the justices. Uh, you know, here in Washington, the Supreme Court is really a unique information, uh, unique institution in that most information does not leak out of it. Uh, so we'll see if the leak investigation will itself be uh, the subject of a leak too, or if the Supreme Court will let us know its findings. And then finally, in terms of being able to see the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court continuing its live streaming of oral arguments. Uh, any changes, any other changes uh, that you're watching at the Supreme Court, how you cover it or how the, the, the American public can, can follow the Supreme Court? Yeah, well, we got word last week that the public can now come into the courtroom. There's actually a line of people standing over here waiting to get inside the building today. Um, so that's one big change is that the public is allowed in and that they will continue doing audio. Uh, but the announcement said they were going to be providing it for this term only. So we still don't know whether or not that's going to be a permanent fixture here at the court, uh, but certainly something good for people who don't want to stand in line for hours but still want to hear the business of the Supreme Court. Kimberly Robinson of Bloomberg, Bloomberg Law speaking with Washington Journal this morning. You can see more from that segment at cspan.org forward slash Washington Journal and on our C-SPAN Now video app. According to the New York Times, 23 of the world's major oil producers are considering major cuts in production. The move would mark a major policy change for the group, which includes Russia and is known as OPEC+. Plus. Since they slashed oil production in early 2020 when demand collapsed because of the pandemic, the group has announced a series of steady monthly production increases, but they rarely have met that goal. Here's House Ways and Means ranking member Kevin Brady of Texas talking about the OPEC Plus announcement. It is, it's been frustrating, to say the least. And, and while we talk a lot about energy independence, energy security, what we really mean is not being dependent uh, on OPEC and other countries' decisions on supply uh, 
issues for the price of oil. And, and you know, under President Trump, America re really was sort of the market maker here on energy prices. No more is that the case. And clearly, there's so much more we could do to expand supply here as well as, you know, help help supply our allies in this war against Putin and, and level these prices out, create more of that stability. So, yeah, this is a this is a self-inflicted wound, I think, from the president. And he still has time to course correct. No one believes he will. House Ways and Means ranking member Kevin Brady of Texas earlier today on CNBC. Also talking about the uh, the announcement, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, she spoke aboard Air Force One. So OPEC Plus signaled over the weekend uh, there could be a production cut at their upcoming meeting of up to a million barrels. Uh, isn't that working across purposes from your goal of having lower energy prices and what, if anything, are you prepared to do uh, in response? So I've, as I've said before, and as we've, uh, as many of us in the administration has said before, you know, we're not a party, as you know, to OPEC Plus, and I'm not going to comment uh, on what may or may not happen. I can say this, our focus has been pretty, pretty uh, uh, steadfast, which has been on taking every, every step to ensure markets are sufficiently supplied uh, to meet demand for a growing, uh, glo glo growing e a global economy. Uh, and thanks to our efforts, we have seen some energy prices have declined sharply uh, from their highs, and American consumers are paying far less at the pump. And so that's going to be our, our focus. Again, not going to comment on what may or may not happen. Uh, we'll let the, the meeting and, and the are you, folks. Are you worried that a, a production cut could increase prices? Again, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals here. Uh, I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying. I, I understand that is what is predicted from this meeting. I believe the meeting is going to happen on Wednesday, uh, but uh, not going to get ahead of, of what the announcement could potentially be. Again, we are not part of OPEC Plus. We are not members of OPEC Plus, and so don't want to get ahead of what could potentially come out of that meeting. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre earlier today on Air Force One. According to the New York Times, quote, a major unknown is the future output of Russia, the co-chair of OPEC+. Plus. Russian oil production has held up better than many analysts expected under sanctions imposed by the West over the war in Ukraine. But Russian production may fall more when European Union when the European Union tightens sanctions on Russia earlier or later this year. You can read more on that at NewYorkTimes.com. Finally today, the New York Times senior political reporter Maggie Haberman is sharing interview recordings she has of former President Trump for her upcoming book, Confidence Man. Here's a portion. But what were you doing when, when you, how did you find out that, that there were people storming the the Capitol. I had heard that afterwards, and actually, on the late side, I was I was having meetings. Mm -hmm. I was also with uh, Mark Meadows and others. Mm -hmm. I was not watching television. I didn't have the television you on. You weren't okay. Uh, I didn't usually have that te the television on. I'd have it on if there was something. I then later turned it on, and I saw what was happening. I also had uh, confidence that the Capitol, who didn't want these 10,000 people. The Capitol Police, you mean. That okay. they'd be able to control this thing. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize that, you know, they, they did lose control. Of course, the former president's response there contradicts the testimony from several senior White House staffers uh, made to the House January 6th committee that the former president watched the riot unfold for hours on TV. You can see more interview clips at CNN.com, and you can see C-SPAN's complete coverage of the House January 6th committee proceedings at cspan.org forward slash January 6th. The committee postponed their schedule hearing last week. We'll let you know as soon as they reschedule it. You can also find all of our coverage on the C-SPAN Now video app. And a reminder, if you missed any of this program, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. And for more on the stories that are shaping Washington, delivered right to your inbox every day, subscribe to C-SPAN's evening newsletter, word for word. Just go to cspan.org forward slash connect to subscribe. I'm Gary Sterikoff. Thanks a lot for listening today to Washington Today. C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Every day we're taking your calls, live, on the air, on the news of the day, and we'll discuss policy issues that impact you. 
Coming up Tuesday morning, we'll talk about the impact of Latino voters in the midterm elections with Clarissa Martinez de Castro, Vice President of the Latino Vote Initiative at Unidos US. Then we'll discuss what young people are interested in as they vote in November, plus free speech on college campuses with Scott Walker, former Wisconsin governor and current president of Young America's Foundation. Watch Washington Journal live at 7 Eastern Tuesday morning on C-SPAN or on C-SPAN Now, our free mobile app. Join the discussion with your phone calls, Facebook comments, text messages, and tweets.